Hello, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tax Talk, broadcast by the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, otherwise known as the CTF. My name is Paige McPherson, and I'm the Alberta Director of the CTF. Joining me today is our Prairie Director, Todd McKay. He's my guest host, uh, while Jordan Bateman, our BC Director, who's the usual co-host, is away. And then we're also joined by a very special guest, Carl Vallée. He is our new Quebec Director. We we just launched in Quebec today, making the Canadian Taxpayers Federation a truly national organization. We are now in all of the provinces, um, and, uh, and that's pretty exciting news. So I'll start with you, Todd. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's Friday. That's, uh, that's kind of nice. It's nice and warm here. It feels like spring, uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's a pretty good day. Awesome. And how about you, Carl? How does it feel to be a member of the team? We're so happy to have you. It feels great, and uh, listen, I have been looking forward to that moment for uh, for like a long time. So to be on the podcast with you guys today is a great thing. And uh, to address Todd's point here, it's a lot colder. It's uh, probably around minus seventeen. So I'm glad to be inside. Wow! Not often you can that live in hard? Saskatchewan and, and gloat about the weather. So yeah, this is, this is good. <laughs> That's right. You must feel very good, Todd. How many times? Yeah, have you yeah, this is unusual. <laughs> All right, so ta Carl is going to talk to us today about everything Quebec. So we're going to hear about all the different fiscal issues that Quebec is facing. I know that he's got a mountain of fiscal challenges that he's going to be taking on, and he can give us a little bit of background and history, and we're going to talk about all those issues. Now, I just want to let everybody know there's lots of ways that you can connect with us if you're watching now. If you've joined us here live, you can make sure to subscribe to our feed, and you can keep track of all of our shows. You can also comment on the sidebar that's to my right, and I'm assuming everybody else is right. Uh, you can also tweet us at... Paige McP, that's me. Uh, our usual guest host, uh, our co-host rather, is at Jordan Bateman. And uh, you can even click call in to ask us a question live on video. It seems like we've lost Todd, but hopefully he'll be back. You can also type slash lowercase q. I'm just going to show everybody in the sidebar. And if you do that, you can ask a question that will be prompted for us. And then we can see it. And then we can answer it. So that's another way that you can keep in touch. Just a little bit about the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Uh, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization dedicated to three things lower taxes, less waste, and accountable government. That's what drives all of the communications, research, and all of the advocacy work that we do. And like I said today, we have become a truly national advocacy organization, so it's very exciting. You can find out more on our website, www.taxpayer.com, to see what. I'm working on Carl's working on Todd and everybody else. And if you're listening to this later uh, as, a, uh, as a recording of the podcast, we still want to hear from you. So you can check out our website. You can email us. Uh, you can email me at abdirector at taxpayer.com or you can engage on our Facebook page. It's facebook slash taxpayer.com. So I'm going to uh, get Todd out of here and then maybe he can come back in now. Let's talk about what's new. Uh, what's new over there in Quebec, Carl? There's there's lots of things that are new in Quebec, uh, but uh, mainly the fact that we're arriving here. I think it's I think it's the right time for the CTF to finally be able to advocate for lower taxes in Quebec. Listen, uh, the marginal tax rate in Quebec is now above fifty percent. It's hit fifty three point five percent. Uh, with the most recent uh, tax hikes by the Trudeau government. Uh, and of course, this is like the combined rate is now at 53.5%. So what kind of message the government of Quebec is sending to its own workers, to its own taxpayers, when they're discouraging people from working, they're discouraging people from creating wealth in the province. So um, there's lots to, uh, there's really a lot to do here. Like in the province, we have uh, basically the biggest bureaucracy you can imagine. Uh, we have uh, we have a huge debt. Uh, our debt is at two hundred eighty billion dollars. Um, so when I was born, I already had a debt to pay, right? So and all of the Quebecers that are born today have a debt to pay that they're going to have to pay later on. Um, so there's uh, there's a lot of work to be done. I think Todd's back. Welcome back, Todd. Can you guys uh, hear me? 
Yes, we can. <laughs> I feel like this is a test to see if I'll uh, use a lot of profanity uh, on camera is really <laughs> what this is. But I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, Carl. You were what I was saying. No, I, I was just saying that we're uh, we're in big trouble in Quebec and we need to uh, we need to really get our act together in terms of taxes and bureaucracy. Uh, so yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of things to be uh, to be done, um, and I th think it's a relevant time for this to make its voice heard here, uh, here like in the province. Uh, I feel like I feel like politicians are not necessarily talking about the right issues all the time, and so uh, maybe we can force that upon them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's uh, does sound like you've got a lot of challenges ahead of you. So we're going to break down some of those challenges uh, in a few minutes here. I have a news story to tell you guys that's really been dominating media coverage in Alberta for the basically the past few weeks. So what happened was uh, the Notley government in Alberta, the NDP government essentially banned a media outlet from the legislature and that media outlet happens to be a quite controversial very right-wing media outlet which is called the rebel it's sort of an online publication um run by ezra levant we you know we've done media hits with the rebel and uh, and and they they certainly you know are opinion opinionated but they are still media and i think still journalists so so the people who are you know going to the legislature to cover their stories um you know i think identify as journalists and so this is why it was very controversial when uh the premier's office basically gave uh, a directive to these people and said we don't consider what you're doing to be journalism and i think booted them out of about three events on different occasions and said sorry you're you know you don't identify as a reporter as a relevant because there was a court case where Ezra was there and said that he himself was a reporter but that's sort of like saying you know Bloomberg News is not a news outlet because Bloomberg is not a reporter um, so it raised all these questions what ended up happening was um, a lot of other journalists in Canada ended up defending the rebel and saying look it's not up to the government to decide who, who is a journalist what is a journalist but still, the NDP government is going forward with a review. They've hired a, a former uh, Canadian press uh, bureau chief in Alberta to head up this media review to, I guess, determine the media policy of the uh, of the government. But I guess there, it also raises, well, there's a few issues. One is that it raises the red flag of, okay, so are we still going forward with the government now dictating who is a journalist? Because the Alberta press gallery in the legislature doesn't determine uh, which journalists are in and which are out in the same way that other press galleries across the country do. So, uh, you know, do we give more power to the press gallery um, or is the premier going to step in here, which I think, you know, doesn't really sit well with a lot of people as a former journalist myself. I don't really like the idea of government determining who is a journalist and who isn't. And the other thing is that the review that they're doing is going to cost almost $10,000 really sparked by a mistake that the premier's office made um so i'd be interested to hear your guys your your thoughts on this i think it's an interesting issue i mean there, there's a similar case that arrived in the in uh, quebec uh, probably 10 years ago where there was some right-wing uh, talk radio in uh, quebec city and their license was being threatened of being removed by the crtc and that sort of awakened uh, a movement in uh, Quebec City where people are saying, well, wait a second, why, why is the government determining uh, what I'm able to listen to? Um, mm. You're going you're gonna to legislate opinions, right? Like that's sort of what like, people are thinking about. Um, so I think you're describing something similar where why is, it, uh, why is the premier's office dictating, uh, you know, who's allowed to be to be like a journalist and like controlling access like that. So that's an interesting topic. It's an interesting issue. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out that, that this isn't normal. Uh, I criticize uh, the government in Manitoba all the time. I criticize the government in Saskatchewan all the time. I, I, I'm certain that at uh, various days, the uh, uh, premier's office in both provinces doesn't like me very much, but they don't keep me out. Mm -hmm. They let me personally go in and criticize them, and they know that that's going to happen, uh, and yet they do that. And so, first of all, I think it's uh, uh, we need to make sure that people understand this is not normal at all. And then, secondly, ten thousand bucks to tell them what? Like <laughs> that's the question. And who are we hiring for this? I mean, you could give Captain Obvious five bucks, and you're going to get the answer on this. <laughs> you know, let folks in. Do you have you know that's that's what you got to do. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's true. It's uh, it's it's definitely a concern, I think, in terms of the taxpayer dollars that are being wasted here. Um, you know, maybe it is important for the government to have some kind of a media policy, but whether or not they're going to determine who and who is not a journalist and whether or not they're going to let them in and give them access, I think, is is pretty concerning. And if this was just a situation of the premier, you know, not really liking the rebel I'm, I mean the rebel they're very critical of the NDP government in Alberta so you know obviously I don't think they're best friends but if that's if that's the reason that we're spending this ten thousand dollars well that's a, that's concerning as well so Todd one what's, thing I, oh, sorry go on I was just gonna say good on the media for stepping up for Ezra on this he, there, Ezra likes to make people mad he is not the kind of guy who has to be liked by everybody if he were here, he would say that for sure. And there are lots of people who don't like him, but lots of people who don't like him stood up for him in this case because it's a more important uh, uh, principle that you don't have to suck up to government in order to inform uh, citizens uh, about what's going on through the media. And good on the media for sticking up for him. I think that was a really positive part of the story. I think so too. It was great. I also just want to bring everybody's attention to a comment we just got in the sidebar, which says great Canadian content and no taxpayer dollars were involved. <laughs> we're giving you Canadian <laughs> content for free. <laughs> so, okay, Todd, what's new over in, uh, in Regina? Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you actually about sort of an old story in a sense, but okay. we've uh, brought it up again. Uh, Saskatchewan, I think, is the only province in the country that owns a bus company. The provincial government owns a bus company. This will probably come as a huge shock to you, uh, but it loses money. In fact, it loses about a million dollars every month. Uh, and despite that, uh, ridership is going down. You have fewer and fewer people actually using this service. So the cost per person using it is going up. We humbly suggested that, you know what, uh, maybe it's time to shut it down. Uh, and uh, because we simply can't afford a million bucks a month on a failing bus company. When oil was at a hundred bucks a, a barrel, it was still a bad idea, but there was lots of money uh, to cover it if you really wanted to do it. Now we're running a deficit in Saskatchewan. We can't borrow money to run a failing bus company and then pass a bill on to our kids and grandkids. Uh, that's just crazy. We've got to start making some tough decisions here. So we raised that issue. We, uh, we got a little bit of fear going over that. But uh, it's good because we've got to have a discussion about making priorities here in Saskatchewan. Interesting. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, the things that government shouldn't be in the business of, one of them is business. Don't be in the business of business. That's a, you know, Ralph Klein said that, but I always, you know, it's a good line because it's true. It mm -hmm. just never goes as well as when the private sector does it. <laughs> yeah, because it, what's the advantage of like spending some somebody else's money, right? There's no real consequence for these people when they're running those companies. So and what's the argument for those advocating for that like company to stay in the hands of the government? Are they saying that everybody has a right to a bus? Well, you know, one of the things that people do bring up is Saskatchewan's a, uh, a uh, big province geographically with a small population. So how are people going to get to uh, appointments and stuff like that? Well, I grew up in the country. I grew up in a town with 100 people. You guys probably had more people in your uh, high school graduating class than I had the town I grew up in. Um, but we can't have solutions, expensive solutions being forced on us from Regina, a uh, bus service that most people aren't using and many towns uh, aren't served by it. Um, I would rather have those solutions come from places like the place I grew up. Maybe it's somebody just literally uh, taking folks uh, to town in their minivan once a, once a week or something like that. Everybody chipping in for gas. We don't need government forcing huge bureaucracies on us that are losing a million bucks a month. We can solve our problems. Uh, at home, and that's really what we're talking about here: big government solutions uh, versus figuring stuff out uh, in our own communities. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, when it comes to like, you know, how are people going to get to appointments and stuff like that? I'm sure that the buses in the rural communities are not super frequent. No, no, they're not. And the, the other thing that is a real uh, myth in this case is that they serve all of rural Saskatchewan. Well, the the town I grew up in, the bus didn't go there. In fact, there's there's parts of uh, Saskatchewan that are probably bigger than Germany where a bus doesn't go. Uh, that's uh, the nature of uh, the province we're in. And if you did try to build that kind of coverage, you'd be losing tens of millions of dollars uh, a month. You know, that's not the best way to do it. The best way is for entrepreneurs and small business people in their local community to ask their neighbors, hey, you know, what kind of a service would uh, would you use? And then step up and provide that service. That's how we do it. That's how we do it for stores. That's how we do it for uh for so many other services, 
for government to say, here's your service, you got it whether you like it or not, and by the way, here's the bill we're passing on to your kids and grandkids, that doesn't work anymore. We got to make some tougher decisions than that. Yeah, I can't, could not agree more. All right, let's move into the the interview that we have all been waiting for with our new Quebec director, Carl. Uh, Car Quebec is obviously, you know, province very unique in Canada. There's, you know, different language, but also a very rich history, culture, absolutely beautiful landscape, but they've got a lot of fiscal problems too. It's a bit of a fiscal mess. The government is quite large, um, quite nanny state-ish, if I might say that in many ways. And so Carl has got some big challenges ahead of him. So I will, we're going to ask him a bunch of questions, but here's a little bit about Carl first. Carl Valley has just joined the CTF just today. His career path has been driven by his desire to see Quebecers pay less taxes. Very nice. His involvement in politics brought him to Ottawa in 2009, where he began working on Parliament Hill, and he served as a press secretary and spokesperson for the federal government for five years. Uh, now, when he was in Ottawa, he managed complex issues on a national and international scale, always with a particular attention to Quebec. And in 2015, he was executive director of communications at the Canada Olympic Committee. Oh, cool. He also works as a senior consultant in public affairs at a public affairs firm in Montreal, in addition to his responsibilities uh, at the CTF. He got his Bachelor of Laws uh, from the University of Montreal probably did not see that very well and he's from Montreal and he lives there now with his wife Taylor so Carl we are excited that you joined the what made the decision to be a member of the CTF or to be a director at the CTF we're paying too many taxes um, and it's time to put an end to that it, it's really it's really a challenge of the mentality here like in Quebec it's always been the you know the solution of like politicians here is always tax and spend and um, I think for a long time there were no actual there's no actual political party putting that into like question. They were just uh, buying into this big concept that people here call like the Quebec model. Um, I I don't like the term because it's not really a model. If it were working, we would be aware. Um, you know, it's not really working out for us right now. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done for uh, groups uh, such as us to advocate for smaller government and for lower taxes because nobody else is doing it. Um, so we have to go out there. We have to advocate for that, um, and and this is uh, this is the right this is the right time to do it. I feel like uh, I feel like uh, Quebecers are finally moving on from the forty year old debate about whether or not we should leave Canada. Uh, that debate has taken up so much space in the in the in the sphere of like public debate that people have not we're not we're not talking about real issues that are affecting real people such as uh, like taxes, the quality of education, the healthcare system, all of those real issues were kind of put aside to talk about these, this like uh, conceptual debate about whether or not we should leave Canada, which is like a legitimate debate, but it sucks so much air out of the, out of the debate that we've been forgetting about all sorts of issues. Um, so all of that to say, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm really happy to be joining this, you know, this, this, the, uh, CTF. It's the right time to do it. It's the right time to be advocating for lower taxes. I feel, I feel like, uh, Quebecers are open to that idea more and more. Uh, and so there is space for us. That's excellent. Okay. So for, for people who might see this on our website or our Facebook page and not know what it means, how do you say Canadian Taxpayers Federation in French? Fédération canadienne des contribuables. All right. So when you see that, you know, it's still us. <laughs> the name that's sounds us, that's right. Us. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> so maybe you can then, you know, you alluded to these fiscal challenges that Quebec is facing. Why don't you give us a snapshot? You know, what do you think are, are the biggest fiscal challenges faced by the province right now? We touched on that a little bit earlier, but uh, I mean, there is a huge debt in Quebec. Um, the debt has reached two hundred eighty billion dollars. Uh, that's you know tens of thousands per like Quebecer. So the second you're born, you're already born with a huge debt that you have to pay off. Uh, and second, is the taxes. Uh, the 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 marginal tax rate has reached fifty three point five percent in the last year with the most recent tax hikes by the Trudeau government, combined with the provincial rates, which are also extremely high. Um, all of which are discouraging people from working, uh, discouraging people from creating wealth. And also targeting a part of the population that are, that are the most mobile that can take up their things and leave the province altogether if they're tired of it. 
Um, so that's a huge that's a huge challenge. So you know, at which point do we say uh, when can when can Quebec families uh, finally start breathing? Uh, because they can't breathe right now. They're paying too many taxes. Um, and they're not necessarily getting better service in return. That's the thing, right? Our roads are uh, full of holes. Our infrastructure is crumbling. Uh, you know, if at least that money was going to like tangible things, but we can't really seem, we can't really see that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very frustrating. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, so I mentioned the debt. I mentioned the dollars. Uh, the debt to GDP ratio is above 50%, way ahead of any other Canadian province in Canada. Uh, so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges, uh, and of course we have a huge bureaucracy, uh, and we can talk about why that is maybe. But uh, there's a, there's a long history to that, and factors that led to determining uh, why we should have such a huge democracy no longer exist those factors are not not are not relevant anymore and so it's a real it's time to make a change now hmm. so todd i mean you're in a province where you know obviously the premier does sort of like to talk the talk of a fiscal conservative but when it comes to spending on the spending side it's really out of control so I'm wondering, I wonder if this is a question for both of you or each of you, but I know, I mean, spending is high in Quebec as well, Carl. Um, yes. You know, how, how have you, or how do you maybe plan to, to tackle that? Uh, is that going to be a priority? And, and do you think that people have an issue with it? And then maybe we can go back to Todd and see what people in Saskatchewan are thinking about that too. Yeah, I I, th I think it's becoming more and more of an issue. I think uh, people are waking up to that, uh, and we're we're seeing sort of a transformation on the political landscape in terms of the parties are talking more about that a little bit. Uh, as I said earlier, it was on only focused on uh, are you going to vote yes or no in in the next in like the next like referendum, which and there's no referendum, so why are we still talking about that? You know, um, so there is uh, there is some real potential there to raise those issues, and and that's why we need to actually raise them, put them out there, and force those who are accountable to answer to that. Uh, because for too long, they uh, were able to get away with um, outrageous, like outrageous, like spending. Um, uh, and not really be challenged because the two main parties in Quebec are sort of agreeing on uh, tax and spend measures. Uh, there's very little difference between the Quebec Liberals and the uh, Parti Québécois. I was trying to find how to say that in English, but you can't. It's just the PQ. <laughs> um, they agree on pretty much everything except for that one issue. Um so they're never really debating uh, if we should be uh, paying less taxes or more. There's now a third party. There's now a third party that is saying that, but uh, they're they're only the third party. Uh, so there's uh, there there's uh, there's space for us to be advocating for that and to raise those issues and to put them on their radar. Uh, and and, I, and I'm hopeful that that will create change. Uh, I mean, like the CTF has had a lot of positive impacts, like all across the country. Uh, there's many examples of that. Uh, and I'm hoping to be able to replicate that in here in Quebec. Awesome, we know you will. So Todd, um, do you, that's, uh, so he made an interesting point, Carl made an interesting point in that he said there's not a lot of um, disagreement between political parties in terms of the spending side. Do you find that in Saskatchewan? Because you've got the, the fiscal conservative talking premier, but he's a big spender and I don't know what his opponents think about that. Well, yeah, that's that is the reality of the situation. The Sask Party, uh, since it's been in power here, has done a lot of good things in terms of keeping taxes low, and it did pay down a lot of debt early uh, in its tenure. But it's spending more than the social government or socialist government it kicked out uh, earlier. Uh, you know, you can argue about the definition of uh, fiscal conservative, but I'm pretty sure that uh, not outspending socialists <laughs> could be uh, could be a pretty good definition, right? And I think when uh, what Carl touched on in, in Quebec is, is a major issue in terms of uh, debt. Saskatchewan, look, in, in Western Canada, generally, uh, we like to point at Quebec and say, what are you doing uh, with your finances? But really, we've got to take a look at the mirror here. And in my lifetime in Saskatchewan, uh, the, uh, the bond rating for Saskatchewan went to triple B back in the day. It was out of an A rating entirely. Uh, in fact, there was concern that uh, Saskatchewan might have to simply repudiate its debt basically file bankruptcy uh, uh, about 20 years ago. That's a huge problem. When that happened, 
I remember just down the road from the little town I grew up in, they closed a hospital. They weren't talking about closing bus companies or, or relatively is, uh, uh, easy decisions. They were closing hospitals at that point. If you want to make sure that, uh, that you've got uh, good schools and good hospitals, make sure you're not sending hundreds of millions of dollars to bond fund managers uh, to pay for interest on debt. That's ultimately what's, where we're going. And either we make some of those tough decisions now or we're going to make it down the road. I am encouraged. I got to say, it's kind of, it kind of feels weird for me in Western Canada here. Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba are all right, uh, running operational deficits uh, in addition to borrowing for capital. Uh, Carl, you're living in a province that at least has a, a, an operational uh, balanced budget. They are borrowing for, uh, for uh, infrastructure as well. Um, so look, uh, if anything, uh, instead of uh, us uh, pointing the finger at other folks here in Western Canada, I think, uh, I think if anything, we can uh, show the example. Here's what happens when it goes really wrong. And, and certainly, uh, Paige, you're seeing that in Alberta as well with massive borrowing. It started under uh, a so-called conservative government as well. This isn't a partisan issue. It's an issue of math. If you borrow too much money, you're going to pay too much interest. And that's uh, that's a road we're all going down to. In, uh, mm -hmm, it's true. In Alberta, absolutely. I mean, we have for years said, oh, you know, we are the sort of fiscal conservative gem, fiscally responsible gem of the nation. But yet PC governments for, you know, more than 10 years have been spending huge and uh, well, well, you know, well over 10 years. Because even even uh, you know later in his tenure, Ralph Klein, our you know big fiscal conservative premier, was a big spender as well. And that's you're right, all under the PC. But I would warn you, don't say look in the mirror because some people would tell you that's what lost Jim Prentice the election in Alberta. So that could be a very controversial. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a delicate phrase. Very for delicate. Sure. People don't like that. Uh, okay, so I have an issue. It's, it's, you know, been a big issue in Alberta, especially right now when times are tough. I know it's the same in Saskatchewan. Todd and I quoted a lot of the issue of equalization and about how there's a lack in the formula that means that even though our economy is in the West, we're still going to be paying more. I'm sure that uh, equalization is a controversial issue somewhat in Quebec as well, but maybe for different reasons, Carl. So I'm really interested to hear, you know, your views on that and maybe what you've been hearing as well in, in Quebec about the equalization issue. Well, I would point out that it's it's not an issue and that's what the problem is. Like people have grown so accustomed to receiving, you know, this uh, billions of dollars worth of checks every year from the rest of Canada while claiming to be like nationalists and like proud Quebecers, in my opinion, and I, and I am a proud Quebecer and I am ashamed of getting that check every single year. I, I, I dream of the day like Quebec will become a half province. Uh, and I know that will not happen until the day we change our fiscal situation, we change our fiscal policies, we change our mentality, our tax and spend mentality. Um, so what I would I would just point out that Every year, there's a story that comes out that says, oh, you know, like this year, the federal government will, uh, through like equalization, will give Quebec uh, now, like this year, it's $10 billion. It's such a shame. Uh, and it, it, it does one, one media cycle and then it goes away and nobody talks about it. Um, I think we need to talk about that. We need to really uh, look ourselves in the mirror. Uh, I know that politicians can't say that, but, but we can. Um, <laughs> We need to look ourselves in the mirror and say, hey, I think we're doing something wrong here. Clearly, we're uh, dependent um, and we, we claim to be proud Quebecers. Uh, uh, let's, you know, let's become fiscally autonomous. Let's actually contribute like, to the Federation rather than profit from it. Uh, so so there's, I think there's a role there for us to play in terms of pointing it out uh, like to the population. Because I think there's a misconception about, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of a lot of people here think that they're getting less than like their their money's worth uh, from the feds, but it's actually the other way around, and that hasn't been it hasn't been articulated, it hasn't been explained. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done on on that front, uh, and I look forward to being to being part of that. Well, it's interesting, and this is sort of one of the things that bothers me about the um, equalization in in Ontario and Quebec. Ontario is sort of a weird situation. They are sort of technically a have not province now because, you know, my family's from the Maritime and I understand that, you know, 
I actually do think that the, it's a problem in the Maritimes as well. It creates a, a, you know, too much dependency, which is not a good thing. But when you're in, you know, rural PEI or somewhere, rural Nova Scotia, you say, okay, if they were to turn it around, if they were to turn off the equalization tap, it would be very challenging. Like there would be some real tough times to getting back on track, right? To getting to be self-sufficient. But when you're in Quebec and Ontario, it, you don't have that at all. You have the population. I mean, you've, you have the capital, you have lots of businesses, small, small business culture. It's, it's not as though, um, you know, there is a real need there as though it is, you know, quite poor in certain parts of the, or, or a lot of the province. So, um, I guess that's sort of an inspiring thing about the Quebec situation is that, you know, it, it's very possible. It's yes, it would be challenging, but it's not going to be as challenging as maybe some other cases. It's definitely possible. And I know, Todd, you, I mean, obviously you have a homegrown success story about that in terms of what happened in Saskatchewan. Well, that's right. Saskatchewan has kind of a unique perspective on this because we used to be a have not province as well. Um, and I would argue that right now, equalization is bad for Saskatchewan. It takes uh, tens of millions of dollars out of the province and sends it to, uh, to places where it doesn't seem to be helping very much. But on the other hand, I think it was way worse. Equalization was way worse for Saskatchewan when we were receiving the money. It allowed us to punt on, on decisions that we should have been making. Uh, for example, we, uh, we didn't maximize our, our uh, resource uh, opportunities as much as we should have. Uh, back then because we didn't need to. We could just, you know, cash the checks from Ottawa. And perhaps even worse, uh, it allowed governments to uh, put off decisions about uh, making competitive taxes. And so what happened uh, is actually at the end of the NDP tenure here, they dramatically cut uh, particularly corporate tax uh, uh, rates. And what they actually saw is two things. A, uh, those businesses reinvested money in their communities, hired more people, and uh, we got the population growing, we got businesses growing. And actually, the government made more money on corporate taxes. They got more money uh, into the uh, uh, government coffers than they would have before. But we didn't have to make those decisions uh, in the past or previous to that because we could just count on the money from Ottawa. Look, you don't help by pe making people dependent. And it's not going to change overnight. It's going to have to be a, uh, a slow, gradual change to some degree. But we've got to start having that conversation. And here's another reason to have that conversation. We're short of money out here. You know, when you look at the provinces that are paying money into equalization, primarily, uh, or in a large part, Saskatchewan uh, and Alberta, uh, money's short here. Uh, when oil was at 100 bucks, it was one thing. Now we're down around 30. If you're a province that's a recipient, make some tough decisions now because the reality is there's less money and we're going to have to figure out how to work mm -hmm. through that. All right, switching gears. I am very curious because Carl, you mentioned to me that Uber is a big deal in Quebec right now. In Calgary, where I live, Uber has been banned and it's sort of in this weird purgatory state, but you can't use it. And it's very frustrating <laughs> because the cabs are, are frustrating. So I'm interested to hear, is it is it a little bit better than that situation in Quebec? So Uber is still operating here, um, and that is what is making uh, the the regulator, like the government, so angry because because the government is claiming that Uber is illegal. Uber says, "Well, no, there's a um, uh, there's a legal vacuum in which we are like operating because we're not a taxi service. They're an innovation to ride sharing." Um, and, and so um, the director of uh, Uber Quebec went, went into a parliamentary commission uh, yesterday uh, and appeared in front of the PLQ, the PQ, and the CAC. Um, and uh, both the government and the official opposition went after him hard. And again, you can see the two main parties agreeing on the same type of mentality of going after, like, the, you know, like this is like an innovation, this is like a private enterprise, having a lot of, a lot of like, uh, you know, like, it, they're actually doing good here in Quebec. They're uh, investing into like the local economy. They've invested, I think, uh, about $25 million. Um, and the government is fighting that because uh, they haven't regulated it. But Uber is saying, but we want to be regulated. And we, we've we actually asked for a meeting with you and you turned us down. And so there's this big back and forth uh, going going on. But the whole time that they're having this whole debate about like regulations, Nobody's talking about the taxpayer. Nobody's talking about the actual consumer who's benefiting from like good, uh, healthy competition. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I think that uh, the debate needs to go back to this, needs to go back to who's actually um, who's actually like, benefiting from this. It's, it's, the, it's the actual consumer. It's like the little guy, like the taxpayer who wants to uh, make uh, ends mean, meet. Uh, and uh, the, like the government is going against that. It seems as though they are. Uh, but you see, they haven't put in place an injunction, which is the case in Calgary, that would prevent Uber from operating. So they're talking loud, but they're stopping short at actually um, uh, banning Uber. Um, so Uber is still operating. Uh, they have uh, very, very Im- impressive numbers. They they have uh, 450,000 requests just last month. So obviously they're fulfilling a need. Uh, there is a there is a demand for this, uh, and uh, people are changing their their the way of uh, transporting themselves based on that service. Um, so for the government to take it away, I think would would probably cost them a lot, like politically speaking. Uh, right. Which is why they're not doing it. I think that's my like my that's my that's my best guess. Uh, but it's been all over the news the whole week, um, and I'm sure it's going to keep going in the uh, in the in the upcoming days, in the upcoming weeks. It just shows, you know, there's there's this innovative service that people are actually enjoying and assuming risks in order to enjoy it, if that's the case. And government is just so slow. They're so slow to adapt to something new and innovative that people actually like to use. No, it's not, you know, it's not on government speed, so we need to ban it or whatever. It's uh, it's frustrating, but it sounds as though it's moving in a more positive direction where you are. Do you guys have Uber out in Saskatchewan anywhere, uh, Todd, or Manitoba? We don't. No. That is Where frustrating. Is no, I know. I don't even know how to contribute to the conversation. We just don't have it here. <laughs> No, but but it is a it's a basic point of view that I think uh, that you're bringing up here is that we've got to think about consumers first. We've got to think about people first. And uh, it's easy for for folks on the right side of the spectrum to always blame the left for for taking away some of these choices. But a lot of these big cab companies, they're just they're just, they're just trying to protect their their uh, their money. That's all they're trying to do. They're not looking out for for customers. Ultimately, they've got to uh, to make that adjustment here. And uh, it's uh, it's really comical to see uh, you know some of these com- uh, these uh, uh, cab companies trying to make their point by making uh, things worse for for people by blocking it's roads and stuff. Especially- like if anything, you've got to compete by by improving your service and, and so on. Instead, they're just uh, trying to make noise. But ultimately, Carl's right. You got to think about uh, what's right for the person on the ground, and that's uh, almost always will take you. Definitely. Right I have one more, um, one more specific policy question for you, Carl, and it's about sure. government daycare. Oh, apologize, you can hear my dog in the background. <laughs> my dog hates government daycare. Um, so in Alberta, <laughs> we're currently contemplating twenty-five dollar a day daycare. This is part of the NDP platform. Obviously, the NDP's won. They quickly implemented, honestly, most of their platform. Um, but this is something they're holding back on because they don't they don't have any money. Shocker, we've run out of money. So um, I'm wondering, though, you know, about the Quebec experience. Because this is the best example that we have in Canada. You guys had, you know, what once was, I don't know if it still is, $7 a day daycare. Maybe you can tell us about how that panned out for taxpayers in the province and, and you know, how it's working now. Um. Uh, I would say it's not working very well, and I have a, a, an unfavorable bias towards it because you know the second that the state creates this monopoly uh, mm-hmm. and and limits the offer, well then you create waiting lists, and that's what we have. We have waiting lists, just like just like the healthcare system. Now it's to the point where women they become pregnant and they immediately sign their unborn child uh, to waiting lists uh, to make sure that years down the road they can have a spot. That's to the point where it's gotten. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not good. It's also giving the unions a lot more power because now uh, all of these, uh, uh, daycares are unionized. Um, and so it makes them a lot more powerful when negotiating with the, with the state and they can go on strike and they take like parents and hostage. Uh, and that's happened recently, uh, again, this last fall. Um, so I I strongly encourage Alberta not to go in in, in that direction. I hope that you uh, get away from that. Um, and, and, but mo- most recently, uh, you were saying it's $7, uh, $7 a day. That's no longer true. That's only true, uh, for, uh, lower income families. And what the government has done now 
is that they have increased uh, up to $25 a day for higher incomes. Um, you know, uh, I also disagree with that because those higher income families are already paying so many taxes. And you would think, well, if they're going to pay that high, that so many taxes, well, they should at least have the same service that everybody else is having. So they're paying on the two f- different fronts, right? They're paying on this end, on this end. Um, so uh, it seems like it's always a taxpayer that ends up paying and, and has to has to pay the price in terms of waiting, being taken host- you know, like being taken hostage by unions, um, and counting on overall un- unreliable service. Uh, so uh, I-, I hope for Alberta, you're not moving in that direction. I think you have to leave the choice in the hands of the parents. Uh, they're the ones who are best placed to make a decision, uh, not the state. I agree. I hope so too in Alberta. Um, having no money hasn't stopped the government from doing much of the things that they said they would do, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, hopefully this, you know, stays on the, I guess, the back burner and uh, and just doesn't get done. The union point that you make is a really good one. And I think it's important for Alberta because, I mean, that's true. You know, you're creating this sort of government daycare system. And and then, of course, just the government jobs or government contracts, it's, it's unionized workers. And that makes exactly. sense more expensive, even if that burden is, is shouldered mostly by taxpayers and not as much by user fees. Um, but, but yes, that's, that's a big concern, I think, in Alberta is, you know, that you, we don't want to see, you know, greater and greater and greater public sector union control. So maybe I'll ask you um, a, a bit of a more general question now about Quebec, and this can be our, our last, and then I know you have a what's new for us. Um, Maybe I think the historical context is important, and and you sort of alluded to this earlier by saying you know Quebec has got this massive bureaucracy, this big state, and there's historical reasons for that. So maybe you can tell us about that, and then and then touch on whatever the next you know political steps are that you see happening with that. Sure. Well, um, as you said earlier, like Quebec has a, a long and rich history, uh, and and until about the 1950s, 1960s, that uh, Quebec as a society would rely heavily on the church. To provide a social sh- structure, right? That would basically, they were the leaders of society. They were looked upon for guidance and for moral issues, but also economic issues. And during the Quiet Revolution, that uh, changed rapidly, and Quebecers stopped going to church, even though they still identify with the Catholic Church. And that's a whole different matter that may be for a different podcast uh, or not. But um, basically, leaving the church behind. And adopting the state as uh, the structuring society. Um, and uh, the state became this tool to, for like legitimate reasons, like protecting French, protecting the culture. That's all fine and good. But also as a lever to, um, to get uh, Quebecers and Francophones in executive positions, in decision-making position. Because at the time, it was only Anglophones, like, you know, like in the province that would be owning companies that would be in executive positions. Uh, uh, that succeeded in, in, in terms of putting francophones in charge. And that is no longer, that's no longer like a debate in Quebec. Uh, francophones have a lot of opportunities, if not more, like they're, they're in good shape. Uh, they're, they own, they own businesses. They have uh, high, high paying jobs uh, in, in, in all the cities of Quebec, but the state remained like the big government, remain there and the old reflexes of uh, spending and subsidizing all of that all of those ways have stayed um, even though the goals um, uh, that were set out to accomplish have already been accomplished um, so why is it that we're still stuck with this big government where you know we're we're actually all grown up now we can we can move on we can move on from that we can actually be freed from we're, we're sort of like captive uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, the state um so the so the next steps well the next steps are to uh, reduce or reduce our dependency on the state here as like individuals and also as a society um uh, lose our dependency on like the rest of canada uh so i think all of that is all entwined together uh and we need to make major fiscal decisions uh ones that will encourage wealth creation uh, ones that will free up taxpayers to uh, actually encourage them to work, uh, encouraging to create wealth. Um, 
And all of that has been kind of influenced also by what I mentioned earlier, which is like the debate on whether or not we should leave Canada. And so we have put this whole debate on the role of the state on pause for decades uh, to talk about this other issue. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the education system, you know, isn't going too well. The, the, the healthcare system is not going well either. Our public finances are horrible in a horrible state. And everybody has kind of let that go because we were talking about uh, existential issues. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but now the reality is catching up to us and we need to face that uh, or we're going to hit a wall and we don't want to hit that wall. So we need to make, deci- we need to make decisions. Uh, so I hope that sort of answers your question. I think, uh, you know, I think just to sum up, the role of the state was to uh, elevate francophones uh, into into uh, roles that were more that were more appropriate, if I can say, you know, that has been accomplished. There's no more debate about uh, whether or not like anglophones ang- anglophones have too many like advantages here. That's not the case anymore at all. Uh, so I think it's time for us to move on. And and that whole debate is also relevant to the role of unions, for example, who are very very like powerful and big here, uh, way too much so uh, for something that they were accomplishing decades ago. Again. Uh, so it's just time maybe for another quiet revolution where we're moving in a different direction. That's fascinating. So it's not just, you know, fiscal challenges. It's not just, oh, we've got some big spending government. It's, it's kind of a cultural issue. That, it is. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. All right. So now it's time for our waste of the week after a an excellent interview, I think, uh, with Carl and, and, of course, Todd about Quebec. Uh, I think that we've got our very first Waste of the Week story out of Quebec, specifically from our Quebec director. So, Carl, maybe you can tell us. Sure. It actually happened a couple of weeks ago, but it was too good to, to skip over. Uh, so, a, a civil servant named France Boucher, she was uh, the head of the Régie du Cinéma, and I actually wrote the mandate of that, of that organization. The mandate of the Régie du Cinéma is to monitor and control the exhibition of cinema here in the province of Quebec. And she was in that position until 2012. Um, when, when the PQ took uh, office in 2012, they want to put one of their own in that position. So they ship her over to a different organization, which is called Régie des Installations Olympiques, which is in charge of basically managing the Olympic Stadium and park that we have here in Montreal, this big white elephant that's been there for decades now, uh, still state-sponsored. So she goes there because, because like the, you know, the PQ couldn't actually fire her because, you know, that civil servants are unfireable. So they moved her over there. Uh, then she went on an 18-month um, uh, health problem. She went away, but she was still paid. That's okay. That's fine. But that ended, and she officially went back on the payroll as of spring 2014, but she hasn't showed up to a single day of work since. And she's paid $180,000 a year. Just to sit at home and do nothing because the government doesn't have the courage to fire her properly. I'm not sure what the cause is because they've refused to comment. They've refused to comment. When that, when La Presse put that story out, uh, the premier's office said, we have no comment. Uh, and, you know, they just hung up the phone. Um, so, but that's not the, it, that's basically the worst part. But there's more to that. There's more to it. While she's sitting at home, she's going to conferences for her professional betterment. And she's charging the government for that. Uh, and, so, and so the government has been paying her to sit at home, but that has also been compensating her for all of those conferences she's been attending. So she's claimed up to $2,000 um, in taxpayer dollars uh, that just vanished uh, for, for somebody who's not even serving the government, who's not even serving the public. Uh, so uh, that, was, uh, that was a pretty outrageous case of how entitled, uh, how entitled the civil service can get um, but also how you, we actually, there are no means or tools to get rid of the people who don't want to work. Uh, I mean, like in the private sector, that would never be tolerated. Uh, so why is it okay for a civil servant to act that, to act that way? It's not. And, um, she, she shouldn't be on the, pay, she should not be on the government's like payroll on taxpayer payroll. So that's my, uh, that's my, my waste story of the week. <laughs> Waste of the week. That is extremely wasteful. So that's a good one. So we look forward to more of this kind of stuff out of Quebec. Not look forward, but it's uh, it's almost uh, it's almost funny to hear about. It's mind boggling. Yeah. All right. Well, that is a wrap for this episode of Tax Talk. I thank you, Todd, so much for joining us, and you, Carl, so much for joining us. 
Uh, and of course, Thank everybody you for having me. Up for joining us, of course. You can be sure to follow Todd on Twitter at Todd A. McKay and fo follow Carl at Carl Valet. That's V A L L E E. It's Carl with a Z. You can find me on Twitter at Paige MacP. It's M A C in both my name and Todd's name. And our absent usual co host, Jordan, is at Jordan Bateman. So you can follow him as well. If you're watching this on Blab, again, be sure to subscribe to our feed. Give us props. If you're listening to this on iTunes, uh, be sure to subscribe. Give us a good rating. Jordan, I believe, is still trying to uh, get a higher rating than the PETA podcast, which is right before us. Just feeding us in terms of rating. So we really want to beat PETA. And then, of course, you can check us out on our website at taxpayer.com. Tax Talk is going to return next week, Friday, February 26th, 9 a.m. Pacific, New Eastern, for more great Tax Talk. Uh, I'm going to be away. It's going to be Jordan doing it that week. And, of course, you can always find it at taxpayer.com slash tax talk. So thank you so much, everybody, again. And thank you for joining us, and have a great week. Weekend. Merci beaucoup. Weekend. <laughs>